uh, New York State is planning on putting two ports in, the Port of Albany and the Port, port of Coyman, uh, and they're expecting to create 3,200 jobs and $1 billion in annual industry spending. That's a lot. Right. And I, I think Rosemary's point really sticks here because if they're not serious, they're going to have a hard time getting these sites developed. Well, a study commissioned by uh, the economic groups involved in this uh, took a look at what it meant mean locally to Albany, New York, and the surrounding areas. Coinman Port's going to build the cells and blades, and uh, the Albany site is going to make towers. So they got everything there. Uh, 10,000 construction jobs are projected. Uh, the tax revenue, and everybody sit down because these numbers are huge. The port of Coimans is expected to generate $232 million in tax revenue through just its first year of operating its manufacturing facilities, including $12 million each for Albany County and the adjacent school district county. So the, the $12 million going to the local schools just from the first year of operation. That's a lot of money. Uh, the Beacon Island site, which will build the towers, uh, generate $163 million in taxes through construction and first-year operations and pouring in about 9 or $10 million into the local school districts. That is a ton of money if that does happen. So you're talking about roughly almost $400 million in tax revenue in the first year of operation. So it's all through the construction phase and operation. Those are huge numbers. Someone's got to pay for that, right? So if someone's writing the check for those taxes, who is that going to be? And is it going to be GELM uh, that were and the tower developer? Are they going to be Marmon, right? So is that something they expect to pay? Because, man, putting that into your planning, that's a lot. Phil, am I crazy? That's a lot of money. It is, but there's, I mean, they've got a deal because they basically, they're going to be able to get some state level support. They're also theoretically going to be able to apply for either the 48C manufacturing tax credit, even though there was only about 10 billion that was allocated for that. There's still some money there. Um, and that, that the 48C uh, IRS rule basically will cover up to about 30% of, um, you know, the cost of your factory. Uh, again, subject to the the ten billion dollar limit, there are a bunch of other you know because energy storage factories are all trying to apply for that money too, um, you know, or have done already. So I don't actually know. I we should look into this. Uh, I don't actually know off the top of my head how much of that ten billion is left. Um, I think it's probably at least around half. So they've got you know some some money there to be able to cover um, some of these expenses that would otherwise be incurred as far as the capex goes the taxes and the tax revenue that goes to the state um you know is is something that the um the supply chain companies are necessarily going to going to have to commit to um but they usually only do that in exchange for number 1 you know tax breaks on job creation and two um some other kind of incentive for or some kind of guarantee of a certain amount of, of order book, basically. Because uh, as Rosemary was just saying, you can't actually set up a factory and spend, you know, $500 million to, to do a tower factory when it's going to end up that, oh, you're going to make like 100 towers and then it's going to sit there for five years. Like, you, you need certainty to be able to spend that kind of money. Phil, Phil correct me if I'm wrong here, but 48C is merit-based, isn't it? It is like it's a like it's an application process and everything. Like it's not just like, hey, you get it because you get it. You, it's like certain projects get it right. And so I would think that this one, these projects would go to the top of the queue, wouldn't they? Potentially, but again, I don't know how they're doing the queue because there are other projects for solar manufacturing. I mean, there's a couple of companies that are talking about building like a billion dollar solar uh, production facility in the United States right now. Uh, now I don't know that they've gotten the commitment from the government to the federal government anyway, to be able to do, you know, that and get the 48 C manufacturing tax credit. I don't know if it's first come first serve. I don't actually know what the, uh, again, we'll dig into this. The other aspect of this though, is we now have another mechanism, which is 
the 45, the proposed 45X manufacturing tax credits that comes from the IRA bill, that's going to pay out uh, for, for onshore wind, um, it pays out something like $120,000 per megawatt. Um, for fixed uh, bottom offshore, it's $140,000 per megawatt. And for floating offshore, it's $160,000 per megawatt. Um, for whatever factory you're, you're setting up, if it's, you know, building towers, blades, nacelles, et cetera. So all these, you know, the, the Port of Coyman and the, uh, Port of Albany, they're both theoretically covered under that as well. Um, so that offers them a, a certain amount of incentive as well. Uh, if they don't get the, the 48C manufacturing tax credit, they can always, um, do their, their annual application for, um, you know, any project related components that they built uh for for the 45x i think it's a kind of a crazy concept this whole thing because if, if you if you zoom out a bit you go there's there's a general fund of tax money and that comes from income taxes whatever fe federal sales tax all these different things that go into that general fund and now you have different places in the country fighting for that tax money so basically this is grabbing federal tax money that comes from all over the country and then concentrating it into one town by giving it back via these tax credits. So, I mean, and that's how the mechanisms work, right? That's how this all well, taxes and subsidies and everything all works. But when you look at it that way, it's kind of crazy to think that all the money gets collected from the whole nation. And then the people like the Port of Albany, you have, you have certain congressmen, senators, congresswomen, it, it, all trying to get that money for their, their constituents. And, and there's, it looks like if this is all to go the way it's written out, Man, four hundred million odd dollars to that one little area is a lot of tax money. So when they build this tower factory up in Albany, the first thing that comes to mind is how are they going to fill this thing with equipment? Like that's specialized equipment, and I don't know anybody in the United States that makes that equipment. I was reading the PES Win magazine over the weekend, and there's an article from Hana, which is a German company that does a lot of tower uh, tooling and all the fixtures into weld these tower sections together, these monopiles together, and all the complicated uh, roller system to move these pieces around. It sounds like a lot of the equipment that's going to go inside the factories, like from Hana, who has looks like has a tremendous amount of expertise, uh, that that technology is going to come from outside the United States. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah. I mean, what can't be missed here is that these are not like uh, two by four factories or pencil factories or anything like that, right? These are very complicated, very customized, heavy industrial factories. So if we were making blades, you need all the fixtures and the moving equipment and you have to make molds and all these different stuff. And there's custom robotics that go into that. If you're making towers, the same thing. You're like, like Hana, like you said, they have the capabilities of like 15 meter diameter monopiles and the, the jigs, the jigs and tooling that's made especially for those to be able to weld them together. Cause you can't, you can't weld the two tower sections and have them off by a half a degree. Right. Cause they'll, you do that a couple of times and you're going to, you lose all the structural integrity, everything. So there's, you know, there's a lot of moving equipment. I know Hanna's got 4,000 ton roller beds, beds to move some of this steel around. That's, that's insane. Yeah. And you think about like the, I know some of uh, my offshore friends, they, they, they're, um, these, they're, like metrology surveyors, right? So really highly accurate. They're licking their chops at the idea of some of these port scheme built because that's all uh, dimensional control surveying. When they when they put those those big overhead gantry cranes and stuff in these factories, if you've been in a factory, you've seen it. You're like, oh, that's cool. But those things are aligned to millimeters from end to end to be able to move those heavy weights. And I mean, all, every single one of these factories is going to have some of those big gantry cranes in it. So when you say, oh, we're going to create possibly 10,000 jobs, man, you're creating jobs all over the, all over the value chain there from the people pouring concrete and running, uh, dozers to HVAC and electrical and like the, the, um, you know, the, the dimensional control surveyors and the people in Germany at HANA over there and with their, um, uh, customized equipment. I mean, it's, it will, you will have the supply chain and the, the tree of people involved in these projects is freaking massive. This goes back to Rosemary's point. If they're not going to have really firm commitments to build the turbines, it's going to be hard for companies like HANA to spool up because just looking at the technology they have, it's not going to be built in a weekend. It's going to take time for them to build the proper equipment to, to get that tower factory up and running, right? 
but they're but it's all customized equipment, right? So it's all it's it's nothing trivial, and that's why it's, uh, it's so, so difficult to mobilize. And and to be honest with you, if these things get done and they're ready to roll in a year from date, that's impressive. Right now, even for onshore wind in the United States, for any turbine that's about four megawatts or above, we are importing a lot of the castings and the hubs and things like that that can't actually be built here because we don't have the manufacturing tooling. All that stuff's being brought in from Germany, from, you know, other, maybe China in some cases, um, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, et cetera, where it's cheaper because of the labor rates, et cetera, et cetera, the, to, to actually buy and, and implement that equipment. So the fact that these offshore factories are going to have this equipment available to be able to do these bigger castings and these bigger, you know, tower sections and, and things like that. It could actually help out the onshore sector, especially if offshore has all these fits and starts and, and they're looking for like, well, oh, what else could we do with this factory that's going to be sitting there? Help out the onshore sector that wants to be able to put up the six megawatt turbines, but we don't have the ability to source a lot of the components domestically. We've got to get everything from Europe. Um, you know, so this, this could be very important for, for us. <laughs> 